okay, so what do you want to talk about then? And what is it that people will, why should they bother listening to you? You know, that's the point. The question is always, why should I listen to you? Welcome to Tech Talks, the podcast brought to you by Nash Squared and hosted by myself, David Savage, that's been bringing you the latest thinking from technology leaders for over eight years. On today's show, our guest is Nima, founder of The Brilliant Communicator. Um, if anyone could just know that I had to restart the podcast because all my communication skills let myself down and I couldn't even say her name. Um, so definitely someone worth having on the podcast to talk about communication. Um, how are you, Akish? Sorry that you had to endure my complete false start. No, that's fine. I've, I've seen and heard a lot worse. So uh, all good. I'm very well. How are you, Dave? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Good. We're recording this just to be completely transparent with everyone. We're recording this um, the the week before the podcast goes out. Um, that's because I'm helping my parents move house this week, as we are now. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm going to be doing lots of driving next week and uh, mm. finding time with you to to do the podcast might prove challenging. Yes, you are driving all you know all across europe aren't you you're doing a few mm. few trips you, you know what helps when you're driving in in foreign countries uh listen to your own podcast to improve the <laughs> place <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> drive up those figures people yeah no, uh, no I, was, I was i was i was gonna go with the tenuous link that brilliant communication is is really ah, good because um yes. when my wife is sat in the in the passenger seat uh telling me no not that exit that one mm. No, she's she's pretty good, but every now and then in foreign countries we get a little bit confused, and then I get slightly aggy because I'm like, I don't know where you mean. To be fair, you you've got quite a you. I think you're a bit more patient than me. I'm. Um... Well, you're not you're not good at communicating when you're driving. Which nah, is, uh, not navigating. At all. Nah, nah. I, uh, I I like to plug it into my maps or ways or whatever, and just tell the other person to shut up um, <laughs> because then it's all on me, right? If I make a mistake, it's on me. If I take a wrong turn. If I put it in the hedge, it's my, you know, it's my responsibility. Sometimes it's a little bit unclear about which lane you should be in. And mm. when you're in a in a foreign country driving on the other side of the road. Mm. It's also the kilometres thing that throws me off as well. Like, I, uh, yeah, I can only deal in miles per hour like or miles. The kilometres thing throws me massively. Yeah, but it's also great that we're like when you're at the beginning of a journey, you look and you go... Jesus Christ, like 700 kilometres, but then they disappear more rapidly. You're also a runner, Dave. That's what you're forgetting, you know. You, you like your Ks, don't you? I do like my Ks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I... Anyway, we got off topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, today's podcast, all about communication. We've got a fantastic guest, someone who is an expert communicator. Nima used to work for the BBC, broadcast journalist. Um, some really good insight here. Uh, we'll be back very quickly afterwards. Today I'm chatting to Nima, someone who I've got to know through Women in Tech. Uh, so look, it's first of all lovely that, that that community does put people together and, um, and it's fantastic for me to be able to talk to you because you're someone who has a vast amount of experience in the area that I work in. Um, before I get into it, explaining any of that, how are you today? I am good. I am yeah. good, yes. No. That's a lot of energy. <laughs> No, it's, it's a good day, and I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about as well. It's lovely to see you and to do this, David. It's a, it's a very different start to the conversation I had before the, the call with you, where it started with, yes, well, it's nearly Friday, and I kind of looked at the person and went, no, no it is Friday, isn't it? Please tell me it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so positive energy is a good thing. Um, look, Nima, uh, I was keen to talk to you because primarily – your most recent business, you're the founder of, a, of an organization called The Brilliant Communicator, right? Hey, yes. Communication is something that a lot of people struggle to do, especially in an increasingly hybrid world. Lots of people come to me, for example, and say, how do I get a brand out there? How do I kind of get traction on platforms like LinkedIn, where there is so much content and so much that people can be diverted by? Mm -hmm. So I was really keen to, to kind of dip into that experience do you want to tell us a little bit about The Brilliant Communicator and what you're trying to do? Okay, so in theory, and I say in theory because ultimately it's about people deciding what they want to do, you know? You can, you can tell them and, and explain and share, but ultimately people take it and do, do their own thing. But communication is core, I call it a core skill. It's something we're not taught at school. We just sort of like take it for granted. Like, oh, I can speak my mother tongue. You know, it's, it's a... A default mode thing 
But I believe that there is a direct line between how well you communicate and how well your life turns out. Because there are three things you communicate, what you need, what you want, what you do. Please, if anybody has any other thing that you can communicate, share it with me. That's what I think. I like to simplify things. And so if you are great at getting across what you need and want in a way that acknowledges the other person's perspective and is able to get your perspective across, there's a lot more chance that you'll get the yes that you're after, right? And so that's why I do this. It's just simply called the brilliant communicator. It's applicable to your personal life, your professional life. And the reason I did this, shall I tell you why I did this? Mm. Okay, so I've had decades on global TV stages, meaning moderating chairing panels and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, you were a broadcast journalist with the BBC for a number of years. Exactly. I did that, but in, in tandem, I also did the you know chairing, hosting, mm. uh, debating, etc. And uh, the third thing I did was teach, train. So the C-suite, for example, oh, we've got this big event. and that. So I, those are, it all comes down to one thing, which is, ah, I have something I want to get across. How do I do it in a way that, ah, dot, dot, dot. And I'm saying that because in my world, you want to get buy-in. That's why you want to communicate something. But the question is, whose buy-in do you want? And I bring this up because in the corporate world, I find that the, the purpose is often um, lost. What do I mean? I have a product, I have a launch, I have a something event, I have a bit of news that I want to get across. Okay, what's the purpose of that? If the purpose of that is to inform, enlighten, um, get a yes from your stakeholder who is your ultimate client or ultimate voter or whatever, that's one thing. But far too often I find in the corporate world, it's peer to peer and above ego, I want to show people what I'm doing. I want people to know that I'm great at this. Gee, see, there is a difference between the mm. two. And I actually posted just a few days ago, a very short thing as I was walking my dog. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, you know what? I think this, I'm going to say it. And it was, when I was younger, I was so naive <laughs> because I used to think that these conferences were all about moving the conversation forward. Whereas actually more often than not, it was about ego fest and not fit for purpose, which the, if the purpose is moving it forward, because it was repetitive and you'd meet the next year and talk about exactly, sort of, the same stuff. So it wasn't about progress moving forward. It was about, oh, we have a box to tick, which is we are doing something about this. Uh, I have engaged with my stakeholder, you know, that kind of mentality. I'm hmm. not that person. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in enabling people to move their conversations, their lives forward. So I decided... I love training the C-suite. I still do that, but I really love passing on the toolbox to people who don't get the opportunity to get the toolbox because they are not deemed, you know, leadership, um, not leadership material, but they're not on the fast track yet. Right? There's something that I, that I wanted your help kind of di dissecting and something that I think will be really interesting for people listening is your perspective on, and I'll give a couple of examples on how you get your message across. Because there are lots of entrepreneurs and there are lots of entrepreneurs and people who are in business and maybe it's driven by ego, but they're trying to get attention. They're trying to kind of find some space online. Um, I am one of them. Um, and they don't have necessarily a marketing budget. They don't have a marketing background and they are experimenting and they are playing and they are trying to see what happens. Two examples. Um, I've been lucky enough to interview David Breer, who is the CEO of 11FS. They have a podcast called Fintech Insiders. They were a challenger brand in the financial market space. And for them, podcasting was a way of breaking through and creating noise to compete with organizations who had much larger marketing budgets. It'd be interesting to see why you think that might work as, as, a, as a strategy for people and what, what things they can, they can look out for. And equally, a podcast that I did very, very recently, it'll be coming out on the, on the channel, someone we've spoken to before, someone, someone called Molly Johnson-Jones, who is the CEO of Flexa. And she has used LinkedIn to build up a, um, a profile where she very much speaks about flexible working. And she 
on the podcast. So this is all kind of, this will be, as I said, in the show, it's all very kind of public knowledge. She got friends and family to like her early posts to try and get traction. But she, to your what do you need, want, do, spoke about what do you do. And that has then led to the, to the need and the want because she talks about flexible careers. She talks about why it's important. She talks about aspects of it. And now people come to her with leads, with requests, because she's built up a profile in that space. And again, an example of an entrepreneur, a startup business who didn't have the resources of, say, a big four consultancy, a whatever, you know, organization. What what would you pull out from those couple of examples? And what should people be thinking about when they're trying to build that profile? So the first thing I would say is I don't see uh, not being part of a big organization as a disadvantage. I actually see that as a huge advantage. Many reasons including that you don't need to go through the small print of somebody who's written something somewhere else, you know, who says, oh, but you can't. In other words, it is restrictive. It can be restrictive if um, there are other things and other people and legal layers and that sort of thing that, that get involved in the creation of the content, right? So when you are your own person or you are a small, nimble team, you can make that call and you can decide, I want to talk about this, because here's the thing, oh, being samey and vanilla and conformist, oh, we want to do a bod- podcast or something, but actually we don't want to talk about these topics. Oh, but actually we don't want to be, okay, so what do you want to talk about then? And what is it that people will, why should they bother listening to you? You know, that's the point. The question is always, why should I listen to you? And what goes back to the point of, is this an ego thing, a peer to peer? Are they your, your stakeholder? Or are you trying to actually move the conversation forward for somebody who you can actually help, a client or a group of people? So the big versus small, I love small or smaller, okay? Small can be in a big organization, but they are given autonomy, trust, yeah, to get on with it. So that's one thing, uh, meaning don't worry about that. Two, the tech these days is fantastic. You can be a whole broadcast studio on your own, right? You don't need any. It's so doable it's fantastic so what is the thing that needs to happen what needs to happen is you doing it uh i have a dear friend who's dying of cancer plus he broke his back he's had full spine i mean this man is a mess okay and he's really keen on getting on video and sharing what he knows has he done it no because he's scared of it you know it's about but but why do i bring him up because this is an extreme example of his time is limited And this is something he really wants to do, but he can't get over his own internal barriers and boundaries. So for everybody who wants to do this, I just say, you can do this. Maybe uh, you've said that you've had people reach out to you, David. People reach out to me for the very same thing, which is, how can I do it? So it's about you deciding and then getting out of your own way. That's a big thing. Um, About the likes and the getting people... Well, you know what? Again, it's slightly... All right, I'm going to take a step back. Well, let's look at purpose. You are putting something out. Why are you putting it out? Usually you're putting it out because you want to cement what you are brilliant at in people's minds, okay? You want to be the go-to person for this thing, right? If that's the case and you get people who aren't part of that mm, ecosystem to, you know, you ask them for the favor and to like your stuff, Personally, I don't think that's the way to go because it's not a numbers game. It's about the right numbers. So it's the right people liking your stuff, the right conversations and ecosystem that's built on the back of that. Sure. Okay. So so I'll add that absolutely. Uh, So Molly, who I I interviewed for that, agreed. She, She, it was very much, it needs to get in front of the right audience, but to get the right people to notice it, it needed a certain momentum first. Yeah, but then what you can do is, it, absolutely, it's, 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 it's a, again, it's about defining things. What is momentum, i.e. interest, right? That's what she needed. That's what we all need. We all need the interest of the right person, okay? So how do we do that? Uh, in my book, ideally what you do is you want to own your brilliance and credibility. How can you do that? By sharing it. And it can be a comment on somebody else's post. It can be creating your own content in whatever way. Things like podcasts or even the old fashioned blog or anything like that that takes more effort. So there's more friction involved. 
is fantastic because there's more friction, less people will do it. So if you do do it and you stick with it, then you build up that traction the longer you do it. But also things like chat GPT. So I posted this thing saying, chat GPT is my agent because um, somebody found me via LinkedIn. And I said, I have no connection with you. How did you find me? Why did you bother looking? You know, why, how did you know I existed, basically? That's the question. And uh, this person said, well, I put in to J chat GPT, uh, who is somebody who does this? And your name came up. And then I narrowed the search and I narrowed the search and, and your name kept coming up. And so I found you on LinkedIn. And I'm saying this because LinkedIn is um, a window it's a conduit as well. So the window is you're putting out your content, great, and content can be comments on other people's posts. And by the way, even if you put out your own content and you want to use LinkedIn in that way, it's actually really good to post on somebody else's post who's the right sort of person for you, who's part of your system, because people read and they get a sense of you and then they check you out. You know, so it's nice and it completes the cycle. But it's about doing it because then it gets picked up by search engines. This person equals. But you know what, David? It's about going right back to the core of this and thinking, OK, what am I the, what am I the go to person for? What is it that I want to put out? So in terms of flexi work, that's a really specific thing. I am doing this. In terms of communicating, I am doing this. Now, what does it mean? How do you define it? That's a different thing. But it's about really being specific. Does it mean you have to be boring and only talk about that one word over and over again? No, but it's about bringing that into the conversation every time you have something to say. I have been told on this point of, you know, making sure that, you know, why should people, why should people pay attention to you? Why should people listen to you? That it's good to be known for five reasons. That five is the number that, you know, here's, here's the five reasons that people should listen to you as a, as a person or an expert. What do you what do you think about that? Because I, I sometimes, I sometimes struggle with the idea of what 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 would pe why would people listen to me? Because it's a podcast that talks about all sorts of different stuff. So sometimes that can be quite diff difficult for people to boil down five things. But I'm sure if we thought about it together, you know, we would come down to a nucleus of something key, and then there'd be things that come off of that. So I'll give you an example. I'm about everything to do with communicating, right? That's my core thing. So it doesn't matter whether it's on stage, on the page, on TV. And it's, it's about how do I get across what I need, want and do? How do I communicate this in a way that gets the interest of the other person? Fine. Now, why is this important, though? It's important because in my book, especially when it comes to women, if you want to increase the chance of you having financial dignity later in life, the way you... Communicate what you need, want to do is really key because if you could communicate what you need, you wouldn't hit that wall. You know, STEM wouldn't be losing the number of women that it loses every year who don't necessarily come back, even if it's a hiatus, right? So, uh, so then it becomes, okay, I'm about communication, but one of the other things I do is because this is linked to having a good life, including... My equation that I made up is ability plus ambition plus uh, success, plus sanity equals sustainable success. I forgot my own equation. So ability plus <laughs> ambition plus sanity equals sustainable success. So if you want to think about it, that is my, those are my things. Are you able, if you're not going to get the skills, get the track record, you need to get across what you need, the training that you need. And then you need to learn how to share what you're brilliant at, internal, external, with your team, with your boss, whatever that thing is. Um, ambition. What do you want? You need to be able to communicate what you want, what I want next. I want to lead that project. I want that training. I want that thing. I want the, I want the sabbatical, whatever. Sanity. If you can't, you can get it, but can you keep doing it? So again, do you see? And that equals sustainable success because sustainable success is about being solvent, staying sane. So you're not, you know, mental health. It's not just about having what we call a mental health issue. I think we all have mental health issues, right? Mm. But it just depends on when it peaks and how and why. Um, but yeah, so being solvent, 
being sane. This is all leads into what we call success, which the definition of which will change as our phases of life change. So th- what I'm saying is the communication piece is at the center of these other things. So I can, I do, I talk about other things. Yeah. But it all comes back to that. And that's why you've got to be able to communicate brilliantly, right? So where I want to finish this is, um, I think anyone listening will buy into what you're saying, but they might still sit there and go, yeah, but how? And to take your point of your friend who has not shared because they're worried, not only are people possibly wrestling their own demons and worried that it might not be good enough or what they might be saying might not be interesting, but as you mentioned before, podcasting, blogs, it, it feels overwhelming sometimes. And yes, there is this ability now with phones that there's a studio, so why aren't you getting on with it? There's almost a, an element of pressure. How can someone practically take some first steps to communicating and not necessarily being a brilliant communicator because it might be their first steps, but at least starting that journey to trying to get their, their message out there? But they're still being brilliant, right? So even if they feel that they are not being a brilliant communicator, they're being brilliant because they are doing something about it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is such an important thing. We all know this stuff around, oh, you know, when we look back over life, it's not what we've done, it's what we've not done. That's our biggest regret kind of conversation. Let's park that stuff, right? I'm practical. I like to think, okay, you want this? It's about the doing of it. So let's break it down to the the steps that enable you to do it. I like to really simplify things and I like things that stick in people's minds. For example, uh, I don't like the word confident because it can be weaponized. That person isn't confident, so we're not going to give them that role. But how do you define that word? You know, and then there's no help given. Why do I use this? Because there are C's that are important. So it's about feeling comfortable, feeling credible, and being consistent. Look at your life, your week. For example, it could be, okay, every Thursday at 3.30, I can carve out half an hour to share the most asked questions this week that I get from my team and clients and customers or or whatever around that, your work or your expertise, with your team, your colleagues, if it's a global organization, you have an intranet thing, or on LinkedIn, you know, I think there's a concern with people, which is one, I don't feel comfortable enough putting myself out there and sharing. That's one thing. Sometimes people can share, but then they say, but I'm not comfortable enough putting myself out there on something like LinkedIn. Anybody can see me, you know, so it's not in your team and in your room. And so there are different levels of discomfort. So what I'm saying is, if you want it, drill down and define the exact reason. So it's not good enough for me to say, I'm not comfortable. I don't feel ready. I don't feel I can. Drill down to the what is it that that means. Be really specific. I can do it if it's on on my own in my office. Great. Then you pick your phone up and you... Do a voice note. You don't even need to have your face on there. And then you use one of the fantastic pieces of, you know, kit, equipment, not equipment, but um, apps out there that let you create an audiogram. So it's you. Your stamp is there. It's your thought, your opinion. And you're just starting to get comfortable. So meet yourself where you're at. Work with what you've got. And still do it. That's my definition of being brave. It's doing it, even though you're really <laughs> a bit scared. So that's really it. Define why you're uncomfortable and then create a way that you can be comfortable. One. Two, uh, are you credible? Of course you're credible because you're brilliant at what you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't want to share. You know, like, so it's about reinforcing that and not doing what I call, you know, this idea of PhD level uh, content. (laughs) So many of the people I work with, what they do is they disable themselves because they want to put out next level. You know, like, look, this is fit enough to be a research paper, a white paper. Just stop. Let's meet ourselves where we're at. And do you have a thought around this? Share it. Did something happen in the meeting that you thought, that's a good point? Share it. Do you see? So it's like, 
Yesterday, um, a member in my community wrote in her profile something to the effect of, all communication is, I don't want to use the word loaded, but that's kind of what, you know, nothing is just, everything comes with background and history. All communication has something else added on. I'll remember what she said exactly. So what I did was I picked up my phone, I was in my kitchen, and I just said it. I said, oh, somebody in my community just wrote this in her profile, and I thought, it's brilliant. What does this mean to you? So you're constantly reinforcing what you're doing, proving credibility by just being what you're doing and sharing it, and getting over your own self, the fear, that restriction, by the behavior of, you know, and you reinforce it. And the last C is consistent. If you do it once and you don't do it again, that's yeah. never going to lead to anything. So it's about meet yourself where you're at. I can do it once a month. I can do it once a week. I can do it once a day. Where are you at? Don't be ambitious with that. Actually cut back on, you know, be really realistic and then add if you can add. Lastly, the three C's. So those three C's together equal confidence. You've got to be credible. You've got to be comfortable with what you're doing. You become comfortable by doing it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be consistent. And the consistency is not just about showing up regularly, by the way, David. It is about consistent, about wanting to be known for that thing. And I'll give you an example. Uh, construction, uh, annual construction industry event. Two women were invited to speak at it. Both of they didn't know each other. I was just told this by the organizer. Both women, they were the only women invited to speak, and they I think, you know, like this is a very rare thing to have a woman on stage in this event. They both turned the invitation down and nominated male colleagues. But yeah, that, that's a different conversation, right? But the point is they're not being consistent, meaning I am the go-to person for this. I want to be known for this. Oh, there's a great opportunity for me to share my brilliance and to be known by this. You know, the people in the audience and the people who are associated with this, oh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so that's when you've got to be consistent. As a journalist, for example, if I ask somebody who is an expert in something, I had a black book, which was like, I'm not going to ask this person again. There's a thing happened. I need this expert opinion. The person says no. Now, the person says no because maybe they're not comfortable being on camera, whatever. Hello, this is news. It's got to be now or never. And it not to, it only means you miss out on that thing. You miss out on the next thing too, because I am not going to call you. You're on the black list because I don't have the time to yeah. cajole. So there you go. The three C's. What are they? Credible, comfortable, credible, comfortable, and consistent. consistent. And consistency is two consistencies: the time and place and whatever, but yeah. also consistent in saying yes if you do want to be known for something. Nima, I really appreciate you giving up some time and talking through this. Uh, it's uh, tapping into a, a wealth of experience and I'm sure it's helpful to, to people who are trying to work out how they tackle this. So thank you for your time and I'm sure we'll have you back. Thank you, David. Take care. Right, Keisha, we were talking about um, the uh, AI Safety Summit last week. Mm -hmm. um, there has been some reaction from it because obviously that happened yesterday mm. i was reading an article uh in the guardian about five takeaways from the uk's ai safety summit mm. i'm not going to go through all five because people can go and read that um at their own leisure mm. but existential risk is uh divisive but short-term risk is not i thought this was interesting the possibility of a the ai can wipe out humanity a view held by less uh, hyperbolic figures than musk remains a divisive one in the tech community um, difference of opinion was not healed in two days of debate in Buckinghamshire. But if there's a consensus on risk among politicians, executives, thinkers, uh, then it comes to the immediate fears of a disinformation glut. There are concerns that elections in the US, India, UK next year could be affected by malicious use of generative AI. Mm. Nick Clegg, president of global affairs at Zuckerberg's Meta, said this week that existential fears were being overplayed, but he was concerned about the immediate threat to democratic polls. We have some things which we need to deal with right now. I thought this was interesting because our, our own research in our digital leadership report talks about the fact that actually there's not a huge amount of big projects going on in generative AI where you do see firms playing with generative AI. Mm. It tends to be small scale projects that they can put guardrails around and therefore I suppose mitigating some of those risks. Yeah, 100%. And I think 
I think a lot of firms, most firms, I'd say, don't actually know what to do with generative AI. I think, yeah, I think if you were to ask the the CEOs, CIOs, CTOs, and say, "Hey, if we gave you a, an AI product, you know, what's the first thing you would ask for it to do or, or want it to do?" You know, most will probably do some sort of revenue generating theme. Um, I assume. Um, not that I'm knocking any C-suite, you know, kind of listeners, but they'll probably think about the bottom line first before they're maybe their people. I might be wrong. Um, but I think where I've seen a lot of larger banks and financial services organizations do it, as it's all been piloted stuff. It's all been, yeah. you know, very small incubator style, um, like you said, projects which they can control and also if it starts to get out of hand, they can also shut it down very quickly. I mean, to your point, our survey, hmm. I almost felt like family fortune. <laughs> <laughs> our survey says, hmm. um, AI safety of the UK tech leaders that we surveyed, only 12% are prepared for generative AI. Hmm. Yeah. Only just over one in 10 are yeah. prepared. So it kind of, it, it, it stands your point up. Yeah. And, and I think, I think even those that are well, saying they're prepared, I mean, I've, you know, do they even know, like, what, what, you know, how are they prepared? Is it because they have some funding, they have some people, they have, you know, projects that they would like the AI tool to sort of help with? Um, I mean, you and I were in a round table not too long ago mm. where there was a, an individual who's the head of innovation for, for, for a global bank. And, you know, he mentioned uh, some stuff around you know, banks and, and specifically sort of um, trading floors uh, almost being very, very sceptical of, of AI and generative mm -hmm. AI because that could effectively be and the, you know, the catalyst for millions and billions of losses in pounds or revenue or dollars, whatever, but also away from that have a catastrophic, I guess, you know, effect on, on the stock market, which has yeah. then... You know, basically, you can bring um, a lot of, you could bring a lot of industries and people to their knees very, very quickly if if it was to yeah. go into the wrong hands, right? So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'd I'd love to know if you're in that twelve percent and you're prepared, what makes you feel prepared? Mm. That would be if anyone's out there listening and you if you are a leader in tech and you are I you know sitting there going I am prepared for generative AI why like mm. it's not a criticism i'd love to know what the assertion is is based on but uh yeah i saw on x the um the platform formerly known as twitter uh pippa lamb who's part of the vc community stating that she just is loving the energy in the uk tech sector this week so you know whatever you think of the government and i generally don't think a lot um mm. they have generated positive buzz this week so well done mm. um right Akish, thank you for your time yeah. and we'll be back on Thursday. Oh.